Yes, so we're looking at revising for the CSEC Agricultural Science. So Farmer Kerry is improving his cattle herd to gain maximum production for his animals. So there's a diagram illustrated here, and we're asked to state the name of the procedure shown. So what's the name of the procedure? It's called artificial insemination. Abbreviated most times as AI. All right. So what happens in this procedure is that the farmer would have identified a male animal that they would have wanted the desired characteristics from, and they would have obtained the sperms using collecting the sperm um, using different methods, um, some of which they may use a artificial vagina they may use a dummy animal and they will allow the male to ejaculate and then they collect that sperm and they basically test it to ensure that it is fit. The sperm should be of a certain quality and it will have then been utilized by the AI personnel to introduce this into the female reproductive tract. So this is basically what is happening in the diagram. So the sperm which was collected is now basically being placed in the female reproductive tract. All right, so the next, the next question, part B says, outline to pharma carry two advantages of this procedure. Now, what are the benefits of doing AI? Now, when you do AI, it motivates the farmer to keep proper records. Um, two, some animals, the male animals, such as a bull, is a very dangerous animal to basically grow by the farmer, so it eliminates rearing dangerous male animals. Um, animals who have gotten old that might find it complicated to basically mount a female, we still can collect the sperm and utilize it in the process. So if they are animals that have good genes, good characteristics, but they may have some form of deformity, they're getting old, we still can use them in our breeding program. It is also very evident that sometimes the female may have a disease. Now, because we are not allowing any form of mating, there is a reduction in venereal diseases. And so it lessens the chance of the male or the spread of this throughout your flock. So if the female would have had a venereal disease, then it wouldn't be passed from the female to the male. 
and normally we're using one male to approximately 10 females dependent on your male um, and so this would have allowed for the transmission of venereal diseases. It is, it is also cheaper to grow the animal. Well, it is cheaper than to grow the animal. So if it is that you're going to be growing a male, you would have to invest in medication. You would have to invest in um, labor, feed, other inputs that would have been much easier than to acquire the sperm from the desired male animal and then introduce it into the female. If you have an animal that is in a different location, you can also obtain that sperm. You have your scrub animal. In Jamaica, you may have scrub animals, the different parts of the Caribbean, scrub animals. And so we can use the sperm from a different animal of a different location and that would basically improve the stock of the farmer the local farmer improvement of the the animal that he would have had on his farm now when you're basically doing mating with animals it is usually said that you take the female to the male and so if you're living in a different geographical area than the male, then the, the farmer would have to find transport to get that female to the male. And so if you're basically using AI, you don't have to think about getting the female to the breeding station. Instead, you can just have the personnel visit your farm and they carry out the process of AI. So these are some of the advantages that would have come out of basically utilizing AI. Um, other things that you can think about is the fact that we can store the sperm for a, in liquid nitrogen for a good period of time. And so we can basically have it indefinitely to, 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 to utilize in our breeding program. It makes better use of the sperm. After it is collected, it is basically you know, not all when animals mate, not all of that sperm will basically be utilized in fertilizing the eggs or egg. And so some of that value of the sperm would basically be waste. Now with AI, when we collect the sperm, we can dilute it to add nutrients, to preserve, and basically this will ensure that we can have a good stock and that would basically allow for better efficiency of the sperm that we have collected from the animal. As I identified a cow which has the necessary characteristics to be passed on to his future generation of animals, state a technique which farmer Kerry can adopt to ensure that all the offspring has the characteristics from this scope. Now, sometimes students make the mistake and think that this is also AI. No, we are talking about the female. So the technique that we're talking about is embryo transfer. So this involves a donor animal, and in Farmer Kerry's case, that would have been the animal that has the necessary characteristics, the desired characteristics that he would want for his um, herd. And what they will do is to basically allow for that animal. Now, being as it is a cow, a cow normally releases, um, on average, one um over um, ovule from egg from the ovary and so they're normally just producing one calf and you can tell because of the size of the uterus it's not like a pig and so coupled with this what farmers will do 
But what persons who are rearing these animals will do is to basically do what we call super ovulation. And that would have allowed more than one ovule to be released from the, the ovary. Now, when this, when this is done, the farm or the personnel would allow for artificial insemination to occur. Um, these eggs would have been fertilized. And of course, they would basically move through the oviduct. And again, throughout that development, they would basically become... So the egg would have been fertilized and that would have been basically moving through the reproductive tract right into the uterus. Now, when these fertilized eggs or embryos are now in the uterus, what the personnel would do is to basically use what we call a non-surgical method flushing these embryos and then getting the surrogate cows. So these are normally animals that we don't want. They normally don't have the characteristics. And so we basically would implant these embryo into these surrogates and they would have been the ones to basically carry the, the calf for the nine months. You know, um, cows have a similar gestation period, the period from conception to birth, similar to that of a human being. Nine months, um, 280 days, around about that time. So basically, we have the donor animal, which would have been the one with the characteristics. She would have been super ovulated, um, provided with hormones. And so she would have released more than one ovule from the ovary. And again, that animal is basically inseminated. And those eggs would have been fertilized. Point to note, if it is that you want to collect the embryos before they are basically lodged into the uterus, you'd have to use a surgical method. Um, so you have to use a surgical method when they basically get to the, about within six days, we can basically utilize the non-surgical method of flushing them from the uterus, and then we implant them in the, um, the surrogate females. So the other aspect, it says, state one benefit of the procedure listed in the above question, which is embryo transfer. Now, because you remove the embryos, you can basically, if it is that you're growing, say, a dairy farm, you know, that you'd want to have females. So you'll more be looking at calves that are females. So you can actually determine, when you do sex determination, you can decide to basically allow for the completion of those development of those embryos which are females. Um, some persons will be saying, you know, hey, you're playing God. But at the same time, you basically try to make it more efficient by selecting the females because those are the ones that are going to be needed in your herd. And vice versa, if you're using or doing beef, then you'd want to select males. Now, it is also cheaper than to import an animal. If it is that you have, you see a basically an animal overseas that has a certain characteristics, what you could do is to get that embryo transferred into your country, implant it in your surrogate, and then you basically have that um, desired characteristics because that offspring would have the same genetic makeup of that donor animal that you had or you got the, the, the embryo from. It also reduces the transmission of diseases. But not only that, because the embryos are basically examined after they are removed from the donor animal, it can reduce um, creating animals that will have abnormalities. So once you check for abnormalities in those embryos, then, you know, it kind of makes it better 
for the farmer instead of after the full development, he would have recognized that that animal have some form of deformity. It makes use of the non-pedigree females. And so if you have females that you're not going to want to use in your breeding program, they still can be a part. It's just that their characteristics wouldn't enter into your herd. So they will basically be the surrogate. And, you know, cloning is one of the things that is has been done. Um, one of the first animals, you know, know about Dolly the sheep. So what they can basically do is to take an egg and they will remove the nucleus. And that would contain the genetic information. Um, this would have been done um, using a pipette, a very fine pipette. And they would remove the DNA and then they would basically implant the DNA um, into the cell and allow for that to develop. And these offspring will basically be identical. And so, you know, they would have actually had the similar genetic makeup as the, the animal that they got the genetic information from. And so, basically, they would have been considered clones. So, there goes the benefit of this procedure. Um, if you look at the disadvantage of both AI and embryo transfer, you know, the technical knowledge that is required to carry out the process, also the startup in terms of cost, um, to store the sperm, to carry out the surgical methods of removing the embryos, you'd have to have specialized equipment. So that in itself would be of a, more of a disadvantage because if you go the whole route of natural mating, then you wouldn't have to think about these um, things to, to, to basically enhance or to carry out these procedures. and white um, is a popular breed of um, rabbit. We have cattle, we have the brown, we have the Jamaica hope developed by our own scientist, T.P. Lecky. We have the Jamaica black as well. Um, we also have the Holstein. Um, we have the brown Swiss. Those are some of the different breeds of cattle. In sheep, we have the West African, we have the Blackhead Persian, we have the Virgin Island um, White, which is a breed of sheep. We are given a table to choose the correct breed of animal from the list provided. We have Vanchas Cross, we have Alglo Nubian, we have the Barbados Black Belly, we have the Flemish Giant, we have the Jamaica Red, we have the large white, and we're supposed to match it with a class of animal. Now, a group, a, a breed of animal is a group of animals that have the similar characteristics, and you can basically trace them based on their ancestors, and you would basically see them having a similar genetic makeup. So a breed of rabbit from the list would have been the Flemish giant. The cattle would have been the Jamaica red. The sheep would have been the Barbados black belly.
we have the goat, which would have been, let me scroll back to see the goat. The goat would have been the Algonubian, the pig would have been the large white, and the chicken, the Vantress Cross. Now we do have additional breeds, and CXC may basically carry any of those breeds. We know in terms of rabbit, we have the Angora, we have the Chinchilla. In terms of goat, we have the Thonin, we have the Tugginberg, we have the Alpine, we have the Boar. In terms of pig, we have the Hampshire, we have the Yorkshire, we have the Lanrys. In terms of chicken, we have the Rhode Island Red. Um, those are some of, of animals that you may find. So when, when we look at animals, some of the animals are what we call dual purpose. And we basically either grow them for our milk and meat or egg and meat. And so we call them dual. They serve two purposes. But animals are grown for um, protection. Animals are grown for... Um, labor. We still at one point had giraffe animals. We have transportation. We have them for food, definitely meat, milk, um, egg. We grow animals to assist us with research. Um, we grow animals for entertainment. Um, in Jamaica, we grow animals where you have the Caymanas Park, the horse racing, and so animals are grown for that. We can get clothing. Um, the wool from the sheep can can be used to create materials. We can get musical instruments. We see the skin of goats um, used to make drum. And so we have several, animals have several purposes um, that they are grown for. So we are looking at a balance ration. Now, the ration is the food that you basically feed to an animal. And once you have a balanced ration, you want one that supplies all the essential nutrients that is needed by that particular animal or group of animal um, in their correct proportions. Now, remember, there are certain factors to consider when you're supplying the nutrients for an animal. Take, for example, you have a pregnant sow, that's a female pig, versus a boar, that's a male pig. The food and the type in terms of the proportion to the nutrients that are needed by those animals would have been different. And so age is one factor the stage of development affects what you will basically feed and the proportion. Like, for example, in boiler birds, we know that for the first week, we would have provided them with starter, and starter would have a higher percentage of protein, which is needed for growth and development. So a ration provides the animal with the correct nutrients, in their correct proportions. So in essence, the animal will require a certain amount of nutrients. So these are some of the factors you'd have to consider when you're going to be providing a balanced ration for a particular animal or a group of animal. So what is it that animal requires? That is very important. The age of the animal, whether the animal is a young, or, as we said, is an old animal. Um, the stage of growth um, can also be related to the age in some factors, but you know that even when you talk about an animal, there are different stages that once they're at that stage, they may require different nutrient, and it's basically varying with the class of animal, um, a goat versus a chicken versus a pig. The physical condition, and as we said before, a pregnant sow, a pregnant cow, uh, a boar, a junior boar, um, 
basically an animal that you would have to think about. Also, if that animal is a giraffe animal, that would require a lot more energy. And so these are some other factors that will influence a balanced ration. So it's not something that is one ration fits all the animals that you will have on your farm. Mm -hmm. It would be based on what the animal requires, their age, their stage of growth, and also their physical condition. So there are basically two types of ration. So we have what we call a maintenance ration. And so that ration will provide the animal with the necessary nutrients that they need to just go about their daily metabolic reactions. So the reactions that they would basically carry out to do their everyday to acquire their energy. And so it's not going to allow them to really gain weight. It is just for repairs and maintenance. While you have a production ration, and so when you're growing animals for meat, egg, or milk, you would basically have that added or extra feed material that you provide to the animal so they can convert it into fat, muscle, milk, or even eggs. And this is very important that you feed the animal so as to maximize on their growth. So if you're just giving them a maintenance ration, they will not be able to basically use, when they store the food, they will basically just use back that stored food and you're not going to really see an increase in their body mass, which we really, in case of a animal such as a beef animal or a pork, um, we would want them to acquire um, a better increase in carcass quality in that that in that we we want them to have you know meat that will basically of a certain standard the thing about feed if you want to link feed to that of a, the livestock industry it is one of those inputs that basically is the largest expense to the farmer and so you want to ensure that that feed that you're giving to the animal, the farmer would basically be obtaining a profit because once you give them the additional food, along with the maintenance ration, you want to see that being converted to meat, egg, or milk. Now, we move to this definition of feed conversion ratio. Now, it's a ratio in the sense that we get to the point of the amount of feed that the animal would have consumed in terms of a unit and how that unit is basically converted to a weight gain. Now, say for example, you have an animal, and usually younger animals have a, it's a feed conversion ratio. As the animal gets older, and we see that in pigs, as they get older, the feed conversion ratio may, may basically be lower. Now, when we talk about that, I'm writing two ratios right now. So we say we have two ratios. Now, when you look at the first one, let's call this one A, as the son B. Um, so the feed conversion ratio may vary with animals within a breed, um, different breeds, age. And so, say for example, you're given a 1.2 to 1. What does that really mean? It means that the animal would have consumed 1.2 kg of feed, and that would have allowed that animal to gain a weight, a unit weight of 1 kg. Now, in part, in feed conversion B, let's say we have another breed of animal and that animal is being fed as well. And they have a feed conversion ratio of 2.5 to 1. What that says is that they took 2.5 kg of feed to gain 1 kg of weight. Now, students always ask, which one is better? The lower the feed conversion ratio, the better it is. Because as I said earlier, the feed is one of the inputs 
that is basically going to cost the farmer or the person growing the animal. And so if you have a lower feed conversion ratio, it simply means in the case of these two animals, animal A is taking less feed, which is less money being provided by the farmer to gain one kg, while animal B needs to eat more feed to obtain that same or provide that farmer with that one kg of weight. And so he would be spending more money on feed because the animal is eating more but is gaining the same weight. Now feed conversion ratio can be calculated. So FCR is calculated by the total feed consumed by the animal divided by the total weight gained. We basically will get that once you get that figure it is representing what kg is needed to gain one kilogram of weight. So let me just indicate the formula here. So if you're asked to work out the feed conversion ratio, the animal consume 800 kilograms of feed, feed, sorry, and we basically have that animal gaining all the animals. So it's a group of animals, 400 kg of weight. So feed conversion ratio, total feed, um, divided by the total um, weight gain, so 800 divided by 400, right? What do we get? So we would have obtained a 2. And what this is saying, remember, we're not going to be getting any unit. The kilograms will cancel the kilograms. So it is saying 2 kilograms of feed is needed to gain one kilogram of weight. So if CXE provide you with questions along a line, once you look at the lower feed and the first ratio represents the feed, once you get that lower number, it's better for the farmer. So in that he's using less feed to gain that same weight. So we want to talk a little bit. This question deals with a little bit about um, crops, um, soil science. We are saying during a visit to a farm, Farmer John's farm, you notice a plot of corn being cultivated as shown in the diagram below. So we're seeing the corn. Um, they're asking what is the name of the cultural practice Farmer John has adopted on his farm? And if you notice, the plants are planting across the slope. Now, this is considered to be contour farming. Now, one of the things that they will ask you about, how do you get that corn in that sort of a line? We use an A-frame, right? And we can basically use that to get the plants running along the contour. Now, contour farming. What is the advantage of planting across the slope? Now remember, once you go on a slope and you're basically removing vegetations, we know that the roots of these plants are basically what holds the soil. And by holding the soil, it binds the soil um, throughout anchorage. It would basically reduce or minimize soil erosion. So when the farmer plants across the slope, when we're dealing with methods of controlling soil erosion, they will basically have two purposes. One, it will either aim at covering the soil, you know, bare soil is exposed to the impact of the raindrops, or two, it will basically slow down the velocity of water. Now, water, we're talking about the speed. 
So if we can reduce the speed at which the water flows from the top of the slope to the bottom, then you can basically reduce soil erosion. Remember, runoff water is what carries the soil, and that is the problem. So what this would have done, once you're planting across the slope, it kind of breaks the flow of the water, and it will basically reduce the speed and thus reducing the speed at which the water is flowing. And of course, as a result, will reduce the water taking soil, which is needed by the plants at the top, the, 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 throw, the slope of the land. And that is basically a good. We won't eliminate soil erosion in its entirety, but this is a good practice. Now, Part C says, Farmer John is being affected by soil erosion. State three other practices that the farmer should employ when growing his crop of corn. Now, the farmer can practice terracing. Terracing deals with converting that slope into minor slope or mini slopes. Um, what you do is to create step-like structures. And again, as I said before, there are two things that we want to do. Either we're going to reduce the, the speed of the flow of the water down the slope, and so terracing acts as that um, method of reducing the speed. Uh, we have different forms. We have the bench, uh, one of the popular ones that we utilize. We have strip cropping. And we basically plant in terms of strips. And what this does is to not disturb the entire land. So if he's going to be planting corn, he would have left strips of vegetation undisturbed. And so plants that are already there would have been able to continuously hold in the soil in aspects. And the distance of the strips may be varied based on the degree of slope. Um, cover cropping, planting a crop that will um, cover the, the, the soil, um, pumpkin, something that will basically provide a cover um, from the raindrops. Um, you will basically do it in such a way that you minimize the space because if the corn and the distance between the corn, those space would have been left bare for the impact of the raindrops. Um, grass barriers, stone barriers, it all depends on what is there to, to, to assist the farmer. And barriers, again, the aim of it is to slow down the speed of the water. Waterways, um, what this does is to carry the water down the slope in a controlled manner. So it basically would um, create channels on your slope, and this would have been done in such a way that the water is taken down in a controlled manner, thus reducing soil erosion. Now we know adding organic matter that will encourage the growth of plants, but organic matter has that capability of binding the soil together. So it could basically, you know, reduce soil erosion to an extent. So these are some. Um, outside of this farmer, if you're basically on a plot of land, um, you can practice rotational grazing if you're affected by erosion in pastures, and that will eliminate plants being eaten fully on a, on a paddock by the grazing animals. We know sheep are one of those animals that are considered to be low grazers, so you have to practice rotational grazing. Zero grazing, um, even minimum tillage is another uh, means of slowing down or reducing soil erosion, where you basically just disturb where you're going to be planting the plant that you're growing, the crop that you're growing, so you don't go and just plow the entire land. So these are some of the, the methods that we can employ to, to basically reduce soil erosion. All right, so we know we have institution concerned with agriculture. Um, it says complete the table below by writing the meaning of the abbreviation and matching each of the institution listed with one of the following functions or the role or um, basically the aim of the agricultural development in the Caribbean. Now, students, when, when you get a particular question and it gives you specific response, 
those are the response that you need to place within the the answer so if they're asking you to match you basically pull those so a lot of times students get these questions and instead of writing what is provided you develop your own you have to be careful with that so at the end of the day um cardi the the abbreviation c a r d i oftentimes students miss the and development institute all right so caribbean agricultural research and development institute and basically they are responsible for carrying out research throughout the caribbean and we know research is important because on a daily basis we have climate change we have situations where we want to improve our crop improve improve our animals so that they can perform better food security is one of the concerns in the caribbean and we really want to maintain that and so they are charged at basically ensuring that the farmers are basically having the up-to-date maybe a pesticide maybe a new variety maybe a new breed of animal there is a lot of work that is needed along that line in the Caribbean so that animals, plants can basically be better improved to deal with the drought condition here in the Caribbean, the temperature is very hot these days. And so we want to basically have a system that would basically allow us to feed or the different countries. Now CDB, the Caribbean Development Bank, and once you think about a bank, you think about a loan, we think about money. And so they should be there to provide farmers with loans. Um, they also have persons who are experts working with. So it's not just to just um, say you want a loan. A matter of fact, one of the things that you maybe ask are what are some of the requirements for a loan to be offered to you? And so you need to basically have what we call a budget or a proposal. And this should basically show how you are going to be spending the money. Now, once once you're going to be spending the money, the, the bank, the loan officer, they will have individuals who are linked to the industry that can evaluate and say, this seems like a good proposal based on what is provided by the farmer. Right? We want to ensure that you have sometimes collateral is important what is it that the farmer has in case you're not able to pay back the loan um you you basically may have to put something a land a motor vehicle or something in place so that we can the, the bank feels comfortable providing you with that fund um there are other aspects your credit history um how you go about um doing business before coming to the institution to make this loan um you apply the application if if you're an existing farmer the bank would want to look over the because sometimes persons are operating and they're operating at a loss and so the bank would want to know because at the end of the day it's they're lending you money and they want the money back and so if they don't want to really give it to someone who is having a business that is not operating at a profit and so they won't be able to you know meet their obligations so we want to ensure that you're able to repay the loan so credit worthiness and those other things some 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 um farmers would have been in jamaica we have the rural agricultural development authority rather and so one of the things that they would have looked at is to see if the farmers are registered sometimes the farmers need to be registered to those local um, institutions before they can access a loan
The next question says, provide two arguments to convince your fellow students to become involved in agriculture. So if you want to look at the approach, we are saying, what is what is the whole benefit of doing agriculture? For one, agriculture provides jobs um, in the sense of careers. There's a lot of careers that you can choose from. Um, agricultural science teacher, a veterinarian entomologist, plant pathologist, just to name a few. So this will provide you with some amount of income. And so jobs is an aspect that a student can take. Agriculture provides food security. Food security deals with the availability of food. And I just want to pause here not to be mixed up with the term food safety. Food safety is ensuring that you have food that is fit for human consumption. Now, food security, it is very important that any country, so this student, any country that is there is capable of feeding themselves. And so food security is ensuring that persons have access to good and quality food. Clothing, we know agriculture provides clothing. We have silkworm, we have wool. We have different things that we can acquire, cotton, from the industry that we can basically use to pump into clothing. We have um, GDP, the gross domestic product of a country. Agriculture um, provides some amount of export as well, and so we obtain foreign exchange. Things that are not there, we can talk about even entertainment. Persons get... We in Jamaica have our agricultural shows, Denby, um, in Carndon. We have our Boston Jerk Festival in Portland. These are some of the 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 entertainment. You know, agritourism is also another aspect where persons, when Usain was winning winning his races, persons were coming and saying it was the yam, the yam that we have here that is causing him to be so running so fast. And so agritourism is another venture that persons are looking at. So also leisure activities, you know, older persons 
get that little joy of going out, um, watering their lawn, maintaining their little plants, ornamental plants, so they get that. Um, transportation, we might not have it so rampant here in the Caribbean, but we do have animals that we use as a means of transportation, work animals, so really and truly getting involved in agriculture will provide you with some experience in, in how we basically go about dealing with crops, dealing with animals. So you should. So again, another question that deals with giving you a table, giving you options to utilize. Application of pesticides. We know pesticides running through them. These are broad. Um, that's a broad heading. So pesticide is a chemical used to control pests. And on the pesticide, we can have subheadings such as an insecticide, fungicide, herbicide or weedicide, mollicide, um, rodenticide, nematicides. And so we use the knapsack sprayer. We can also use a mist blower to basically um, apply these pesticides. The rotovator, the rotovator is very important. When you think about tillage, this is the manipulation of the soil. And so we have two primary and secondary. The primary tillage just aimed at turning over the soil, um, inverting the soil, placing what is at the top, at the bottom, kind of get that mixture. Um, we have large lumps. And so the rotovator will be very efficient in chipping those large lumps into final pieces that would create a better root and soil um, contact root and seed sorry soil and seed contact very important um, the cedar we have some of the cedars that basically also apply fertilizers but planting and spacing maintaining that you know plants have planting distance that will minimize the occurrence of competition we have the display and that is used for basically again primary tillage turning over the soil um, so plowing up the soil to improve the physical conditions. So again, this question gave you some specific um, information that you need to input in the table. You should have chose those um, in, um, inputs based on your knowledge about the different farm machines. So we're looking at the tractor. It says discuss three measures um, farmers should take for the care and maintenance of a tractor. Um, one of the things I want to indicate here, meaning the tractor. And oftentimes students say, but sir, I know the soil. Um, not because it is working in the soil. It doesn't mean that the tractor, you don't have to wash it. It's just like a regular vehicle. So at the end of the day, we want to ensure that it is clean. Um, so even though we go out there and we're using it for plowing, the tractor should be clean, right? We want to also check the coolant in the radiator because this system helps to maintain the temperature, cooling down the engine of the tractor so as to not prevent damage due to overheating. So we want to check the coolant level. Three, normally once you're doing maintenance, you have to do a walk around inspection. And at this time, you get the opportunity to see if you're having any leaks. Very, very evident indication that something is wrong. Once you're having an oil leak, um, you want to check if there is any loose nuts and bolts. Very critical. You don't want to go into the field working and something happens. This can lead to basically a safety issue. We want to check the air filter, oil filter. And these are critical because, again, it affects the whole operation of your engine, you know, oxygen is very needed for the combustion. And so the filter, the air quality should be reaching that engine. The oil needs to be filtered. We don't want anything, water getting into the oil, 
and um, other sediments that will, you know, cause the 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 reduce the the span of your machine. As a matter of fact, I want to talk about this as well. A lot of times, as human beings, we we get a device, and the tractor is no different. It it should be operated in a particular way, and so one of the things that you should do as an operator or somebody who owns a tractor is to read the manual. The manual is very important in how you basically go about maintaining because better maintenance prevents loss. The time that that tractor is down will basically reduce your profit as a personnel. So we need to ensure that we do proper maintenance. Um, in terms of the tire, we can check the tires to ensure they have the correct air. The this can influence the aneuphoras, sorry, are uh, in at a per at a at a specific distance. And so you want to ensure that you basically check the air in the tire for that when you're going out into the field you do not um kinda have that you know, incorrect alignment. All right, so it says, give one reason for vaccination, for the vaccination of boiler birds, or boiler chicks. And we know that they are vaccinated to basically improve their survival or protection against the occurrence of a disease. Um, some of these diseases will cause the death of the bird. So vaccination helps to do that. Um, it says cannibalism is a problem in poultry production. State four factors that can cause birds to practice this. So cannibalism is basically where you have the organism feeding on its similar um, organism to obtain food. One of the major cause is starvation. So if the boiler birds are not getting food or if they feed run out they can turn on each other um stress such as heat so heat stress um this can lead to the animals practicing cannibalism disease um improper lighting a nutrient deficiency um even an open wound once there is something along that line you can have birds basically pecking on each other. We know the the activity that we do to minimize this is to, in terms of layers, we do de-beaking. So we basically remove an inch of the beak. It kind of minimizes cannibalism. We're examining the room, the, the digestive system of a ruminant. We know a ruminant, and we want to clear up this misconception. It's not a situation where they have four stomachs. It's a situation where they have a four-compartment stomach. Now, ruminants are capable of basically breaking down the cellulose. If you can recall, one of the things of glucose when you get down into the whole production of glucose by plants, they utilize that glucose. One of the fate of it is to basically be a part of the cell wall. And so it is converted to cellulose. Now, this cellulose is not able to be digested if you're not equipped with the microorganisms. So a ruminant has a four-compartment stomach. We basically have the rumen, which is the largest part. We call that the fermentation vat. Um, and this is where we have the microorganisms such as bacteria and protozoa. And they will help with the fermentation, the breaking down of the cellulose, of the cellulose so that the animal can get the energy. And that's why a cattle, a sheep, or goat can basically consume roughage, as we put it. No, so it says give an example. Give one example. We both basically answer that part. You can have a sheep, a goat, a cattle. State one function of the part labeled A. The part labeled A is the rumen, and we know the rumen is the fermentation vat, and this is where the animal, once it is grazing, it will basically sense. Just collect the, if you're thinking about a cattle, 
they will be going through the pasture and what they will be doing is just consuming the grass or the plant material and it will be stored there in the rumen until it is basically regurgitated and then further chewing is actually done. So it's like a storage area and as we said that is where fermentation will basically take place. So when we when we speak about the next question, it says name two vegetable crops that are normally sown indirectly into the field. And indirectly in the sense that we start them off in a nursery and then when they reach about three to four weeks, we basically transplant them into the field. Normally the size of the seeds will basically be a, be a, a very important factor. The smaller seeds, we normally start them off. But example, tomato, pak choy, um, lettuce, cabbage, sweet pepper. These are some of the, 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 the vegetables that we basically start or sow indirectly. Directly, things like carrot, um, cucumber, those are the larger seeds. The corn, we normally sow those directly in the field. The next question speaks to listing two major requirements for the germination of vegetables. And we want to clarify and clear up this. When we are talking about germination, it is the seed develop into a seedling. Now, the factors, factors of germination, temperature. Temperature is very important. And if you want to get technical, the stored food, the enzymes that are there, they need a particular temperature for, for them to basically become active. So it's very important that that temperature is very um, optimum for the enzymes to carry out their function. So temperature is one. Moisture. Moisture is needed because, again, this will basically allow for the nutrients that is stored to become soluble. And so once that is soluble, then it can serve its purpose. Also, oxygen. Oxygen is another requirement. Oxygen is needed for respiration. So while you have that food, the cells are now going to be needing that oxygen to respire. Now, we want to clear up some things. Nutrients is not necessary for um, a requirement. Sunlight, a matter of fact, when you sow the seeds, they're normally in the dark. Um, when you cover them, so at the end of the day, sunlight and nutrients is often what students will present. Bear in mind, those aren't the the a part of the requirement a matter of fact sunlight the plant the seed would not have produced any leaves for it to capture that light to acquire the 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 do the whole process of photosynthesis so that is out all right so the next question speaks to farmer beckham is in the process of preparing his land to plant some crops prior to his land preparation activity he did a soil test, and the results show that he had a clay soil type on his plot of land. Explain to Farmer Beckham three reasons why he should construct drain on his land. Now, a drain is what will help with drainage, and drainage is the removal of excess water. Now, three reasons. Um, the clay type soil is a type of soil that will basically have fine particles, the water holding capacity is very good. And so he wants to minimize water logging. So construction of drains would be critical. This will take away the excess water. Two, by taking away the excess water, what this will do is to give him a better variety of crops that he can grow. Because if the water logging condition is evident, then he might be limited into the types of crops that can basically withstand that sort of condition. Now you have some microorganisms, some bacteria. The denitrifying bacteria, they are anaerobic, they respire anaerobically. Now we know that water basically takes, the, it is actually in the pore space. 
And so the poor space is where you find water and air. So if the wa if the soil is waterlogged, then it will basically force the air out. This will encourage these types of um, bacteria within your soil, and they will basically convert back that um, nitrates back into the atmospheric nitrogen, which is going to basically let your soil be less fertile, and you don't want that. So drainage is very good in terms of that. We also understand that when you have proper drainage, it improves the root penetration. Um, it encourages roots to get deeper into the soil. Um, when the water is close to the surface of the soil, shallow roots, and so the plants are not so well um, anchored. And so we want to do drainage. A matter of fact, we want to get technical again. And we know one of the diseases that is caused by um, moisture normally affects seedlings within the nursery. We call it um, damping off. It's a fungal infection. But water in itself, an excess in water will increase um, diseases caused by fungus. So if you do drainage, then that will help. Right? So those are the benefits that you can talk to farmer Beckham about. Encourage him to practice those. Now, when we talk about this aspect, it says state the meaning of the following laws. And as I said, we're doing an extensive, just a quick review before we get into the exam. We said the law of supply. We know supply is the quantity of produce uh, made available at a particular point in time. And so the law of supply states that once you have a higher price, there's going to be a higher um, it will increase the amount of the quantity of supply. Um, demand is the basically amount of commodity that persons are willing to buy at a particular price at a particular point in time. And the law of demand states that once you have a high, an increase in the price, it will basically have a negative impact on the quantity demanded. Right. The next part says outline four factors that can cause the demand of a commodity to decrease or increase. A demand for a commodity can increase or decrease based on taste and preference. Will basically buy a good goods or utilize service based on season. And we see that with egg, we see that with soil. Around Christmas time, we see that with meat. So there's an increase in baking. So there's a higher demand for eggs at that time. And so, you know, the demand will increase. Um, so taxation is one thing. If you basically have the government putting on tax on a particular goods or service, then persons may just opt to buy less. Or if they remove tax, they will basically be um, um, purchase more. The consumer's income, um, one of the things in Jamaica, we have just gone through the compensation of the, the, the workers, right? And so what you may find, persons are now able, or what should have been happening is that persons are now able to spend more because they're earning more. So an increase in income normally affects the demand of a commodity. The, the, the drop or demand of another, the price of another, you know, we we would have considered it a supplementary um, good. So like when we're purchasing bun, we normally buy cheese. And so if the price of cheese may basically go up, right, that may influence the person's purchasing um, the bun because the price of cheese, and we normally have those two coupled together. So those are some of the factors that would basically, in, um, you know, decrease or increase the demand. Maybe a natural disaster may cause the demand for a particular crop um, based on what is happening in that point of time. As I said before, taste and preference, persons become more health conscious. Persons are more into vegetables and those type of healthy eating. And so we may see an increase in a particular um, crop, right? So we're using the graph below to answer the questions which follow. 
And this graph is showing the demand of cabbage in the month of June 2013. Now, again, if you didn't, if you weren't informed with that title, and you wanted to know, is this a demand curve or a demand um, graph? You basically can know by it, the demand slows from top left to bottom right. And so you can look at that. And we're seeing a point X. The question says, using your knowledge of demand, explain what is happening at point X. Now, students sometimes have a basic misconception saying that the price is increasing, the quantity is increasing. Really and truly, it's very straightforward, it's very simple. So at point X, we're seeing a price of $2. And at that price, a quantity of 3 kg is demanded. So it's really based on what you're showing. So at that point, we're not showing a comparison, so we don't want to hear an increase or decrease. Just state what is happening at that point. Now, the next question speaks to what will happen. So if the price moves from $2 to $1, so there's a decrease in price. A decrease in price will basically have a positive impact on the quantity demand. So what we will do, we basically, if you're in the exam, you take a ruler to where it will basically touch the, the curve. And then you basically carry it. So we are supposed to have that something in, in that sense. Now, really and truly, you'll be a bit, a bit more precise on the Word document. So we're working with that. We don't have any um, intervals in terms of the strokes to really show. We. So we're just going to estimate at about 5.8 in terms of kg. So again, we see the law of demand happening right here. So if the price gets lower, we're going to have an increase in the quantity demand at that point in time. So it used to be 3 kg, and because the price moved from one, sorry, from two to one dollar, then we saw an increase in the quantity demanded. And of course, the show this new, we did that, so we would have labeled that Y. Um, it says, how will the consumers respond to the change in price? We know once the price is lower, then they are going to basically purchase more. They have a better chance of getting more produce, more cabbage for that uh, money that they used to spend. The next question speaks about um, a species of freshwater fish. One of the major species that we use is the tilapia. And basically, you'll get your one mark along that line. It says, state the economic importance of rearing bees. We jump into bees. We know bees are those social insects. Um, bees are important in the sense that the jobs that it provides. When we talk about jobs in terms of apiculture, we, we have persons who are making the boxes. We have persons who are actually apiculturists who sell the honey. So we can get food. We also can get other byproducts, wax, propolis, royal jelly. So we have that aspect in terms of medicine. We have that aspect in terms of pollination. We know one of the major pollinators are the honeybee, and they help to transfer the pollen grain from the anther. And this helps in the production of fruits because we know after pollination, you have fruit formation. So sometimes persons even rent their bees in the citrus industry. Um, they will basically get the farmers to place their their epic, their, their hives within the, the, the area of the trees and the citrus, and this should improve the amount of yield. Um, obtain. So we basically have those for the economic importance of bees. We are asked to identify and state the use of the tools and equipment in the picture below. Now the A is the smoker and we use the smoker to basically mask the pheromone of the queen. 
it is basically what we use to control the bee, keep them calm. Now, bees are normally in the wild, once they sense the smoke, they will go and run and eat their honey. Um, the abdomen will become swollen because they think it is a forest fire. And so it kind of minimizes the amount of sting. And as we said, it really, you know, masks the pheromone that sent that the queen would have basically be emitting to indicate to the other bees. The honey extractor, extractor, it uses centrifugal force. And what this does is to allow for the removal of the honey from the frames. And so we basically can get it being um, collected and then we strain and we bottle accordingly. We have the hive tool and the hive tool is very important because these bee, as we said before, they produce something such as propolis, which is their, you know, it's like a glue substance. And so you have to use the hive tool to pry the frame to remove the covers. Um, the veil, the veil come in different form, that's D. And what you use this for is for the protection. So it protects the, the apiculture is from getting stung by the bee, right? We just want to talk a little bit about the bee. We know we have the different castes. We have the worker, we have the queen, and we have the drone. The queen and the worker are both females. The difference between the queen and the worker is that the queen is longer. The queen basically has the capability of laying eggs, fertile eggs. Um, the workers are the ones that actually carry out the different jobs in the hive, cleaning, feeding the larva, collecting pollen, basically maintaining the cleanliness of the hive, um, getting nectar. So the workers also guard the hive. The drones, on the other hand, we know that because this thing is a part of the reproductive tract of the female, only the workers and the queen can sting. Um, so the drones, they don't have any sting. The drones, their main responsibility is to mate with the queen. So when the queen emerges, she goes on this nuptial flight where she can mate with up to, you know, 10 drones and she collects the sperm for her entire life. And then she goes back into the hive. And once she enters the hive, that is where she is going to be laying eggs. You know, she can lay up to 1,000 eggs per day. Um, so basically, the, the queen, that's her major function, keeping the hive together. And the workers will carry out the different tasks. Um, some of the diseases that affect um, bees, we have the verura mite. We have the wax moth, we have American fold brood, we have European fold brood. You need to be familiar with some of those diseases, right? We, we, we basically would have covered some amount of information. We want to quickly also dive into sighting an apiary. We want to keep it away from pesticides, where we basically put the apiary culture unit, keep it away from pesticides. We want to ensure that there's a good source of water a good source of food, plants, away from built-up areas, away from direct sunlight. Um, they should be from strong wind, from animals that are basically moving around, straight animals. We basically should have it from water logging areas. So a good pathway to your apiary is also important. And so that would have covered a little synopsis. Remember, we're just dealing with some exam preparation topics. So we want to say thanks for watching and we want to encourage persons to subscribe. Um, if you have questions, you can always post them in the comments. We can basically do a video on whatever clarity you need and all the best on your external exam. All right, making it buckle down.